Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you and so grateful. Great home to come to in Gulf Breeze, and we're going to be looking at a wonderful future home that you and all true believers get to go to and look forward to. That's what I want to focus our time on today is our eternal state. Two things, kind of a twofold, what it's going to look like kind of in my introduction, but also I have some teaching points of um, how we ought to be preparing for, how to live, practice the things that God wants us to do now in our present age. Um, and so if I can, I'm going to get a couple, get my first slide up there if you can, please, of my teaching points. We're going to look at um, chapter 22 of Revelation and from 7 uh, on to 12 and a few other verses there. First point is keeping the words of the prophecy of this book. Second is worshiping God in verse 9, uh, proclaiming the words of the prophecy of this book, verse 10, and then serving God, longing for Jesus, and then do not add or take away from the prophecy of the books. So those are some of the commands. There's promises, there's warnings, great instructions in there for all of us believers as we're getting ready for our future home. So I'm going to pray and read the text and we'll get right into it. Um, but again, thank you for the invitation, John. It's just great to be with all of you here. Lord Jesus in heaven, we love you so much and we thank you for your faithful and wonderful word, Lord, that is so true and trustworthy as the angel points out in our text this morning, how we can completely depend on it. Lord, that all that you've said in the past and what you're saying about the present and the future, Lord, it's all going to come to pass. Lord, you are truly the one, not only worthy of our praise, but the tr one that we can truly trust. And uh, Lord, we, I'm just so grateful for that. Thank you for the home that you've prepared for each one of us that we get to look forward to. And Lord, you encourage us to long for. Lord, this is just a time of passing through. We're just pilgrims, Lord, here. Um, passing through. And Lord, we, we look forward to the eternal state, the one that lasts forever. So Lord, thank you for preparing a place for us. Thank you, Lord, for our kids, too, that they can look forward to this wonderful state, eternal state ahead. And Lord, I pray that your word would be now um, directed by the Spirit of God and you'd penetrate the hearts. Lord, may our hearts be tender and soft, our ears be open to listen. And Lord, let your will be done, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's... Let's go to Revelation chapter 22. I'm going to just read from verse 1 down to 12. We're going to look at verse 17 and 18 down to 20, but I'm just going to read the first 12 verses and get into it. Verse 1, it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear and crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on the either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. They are, I'm sorry, verse, uh, verse 5, there shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he, this is one of my first points, who keeps the word of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, see that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. 
He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, and the last. Christian, we have great things to look forward to. The future for us is very bright, and I can't wait for us all, as Paul would say in Thessalonians, a wonderful family reunion that we will have and get to experience one day. And I want to encourage, the word encourages us to long for it, to pray for it, to look forward to that day. Uh, the angel here that's speaking to John in chapter 22 uh, is going to give us a little bit of the interior of this wonderful future home we're going to, but I also want to take chapter 21 quickly and look at the exterior of our future home that you and I will be in. And I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 9. The things that God has prepared for you and I, the ones who love him, he says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Now, that is true. When you study, and I know Neil and John, they're going to be jumping back into Revelation. You've kind of taken the first half of it. Dustin, we just completed the whole book, and it's just so wonderful to go through. It's true, like John says, there's sweetness of it, and there's bitter parts. We're going to talk about, too, there's hard parts as well uh, as, we, as we read through it. But they're both good, and uh, God wants us to hear and study them. But God does reveal and he wants to reveal more and more to us. Yes, it's true that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, but we do get little glimpses here and there in the book of Revelation. We're going to have a little bit about that this morning. I'm going to go to my second slide, if you could put that up. And I just want to kind of give a difference of um, what the Bible talks about, what we had in the beginning of the world, and then, of course, what we get to experience and have in our eternal state, the end, um, really, which it's not the end for us believers, it's the very beginning. Um, and I want to read these uh, together. In the beginning, in Genesis, the sun is created. Revelation, you're going to read, the sun is not needed. The sea is created in Genesis. There's no more sea at the end of the world. Satan is victorious in the beginning of the world. Satan is defeated at the end of the world. Sin enters the human race in the beginning of the world. Sin is banished at the end of the world. People run and hide from God in the beginning of the world. People are invited to live with God forever. So again, just to encourage you, wonderful things that we get to look forward to. In Revelation 21, I'm just going to briefly kind of skim through it real quick. It just gives us a little bit of um, kind of what we get to look forward to, to our future home. Revelation 21, 5, uh, Jesus says, I'm going to make all things new. So as we look in Revelation and kind of think about our future state, our future home, we must remember and understand that it's going to be completely different from this world and earth that we live on today. Completely new. Behold, he says, I make all things new. The angel, therefore, says after, these words are faithful and true. And so for our new earth and our new heaven to come, which Jesus says and talks about in Revelation chapter 21, he says and explains that the earth that we live on now and even the heavens, they're going to pass away. Second Peter says how? He says they're going to be dissolved. They're going to melt away. They're going to burn for the, our new earth and new heaven to come to pass. There's also going to be a new capital city, not New York, not New Orleans, but New Jerusalem. 
There's going to be a place, the Bible says, it's going to be holy. It's going to be crystal clear. It's going to be like precious stones, Scripture says in chapter 21. And it's going to be called the New Jerusalem. It's going to be God's headquarters. It's going to be a place where, where we're going to be there and dwell with God and see him face to face. Scripture says, again, I'm going quickly, but in verse um, 10 down to 16, talks about how it's going to be a cube. It's going to be like a square descending out of heaven. This is interesting. As you study chapter 21, the size is going to be 12,000 furlongs in length and width and height. It says that all length, width, and height will be equal in measurement. So it's going to be a cube coming out of heaven. 12,000 furlongs, I looked it up, it's, it's about, imagine 1,500 miles in each direction. So in height, in width, in length, is about 1,500 miles each direction. It's like you and I traveling from the state of Maine going down to Florida. The height is going to be that long. The width is going to be that long. The length of the city is going to be that long. Some Bible scholars say it's going to be slightly smaller than our moon. And those who have studied the moon, the moon is absolutely humongous. This city, God's headquarters, that's going to be on our new earth, is going to be just smaller than that. We've already read no sea. We're going to see in a moment there is going to be water there, but there's going to be no salt water, no ocean there. There's going to be no night there because the Lamb will light it up. And then inside our city, this is where we see in chapter 21, starting in verse 1, I'm sorry, chapter 22, verse 1, he reads, the angel shows, there's going to be this pure river of water of life. There's going to be a river that's going to be crystal clear. The psalmist says in uh, chapter 46, it's a river that shall make glad the city of God. So it's a river that makes us glad in the holy place, the tabernacle of the Most High. It's going to be for your enjoyment and for my enjoyment. So Chapter 22 kind of answers big questions I knew I had as a kid. You might perhaps have as an adult, but are we going to drink and are we going to eat in heaven in our eternal state? That's a really popular question. And right here it says that we will drink from the water of life. Uh, John will mention that in Scripture. Uh, we won't need water like we do now. We're not going to worry about dehydration. We need water now to live, but in heaven, it's just going to be for your enjoyment and for my enjoyment. Food is going to be the same. Notice in verse 2 of chapter 22, he says there's going to be a tree of life there. So there's going to be a river that's pure and crystal and, and uh, 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 a river that we can drink from, but there's also going to be a tree of life with fruit. Uh, it's the same tree that was mentioned in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. And then John brings it up again in Revelation chapter 2, uh, verse 7, where Jesus actually says to him who overcomes, or in other words, he, he who believes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So the tree that we saw in the garden it's going to be back in heaven, in God's headquarters. It's going to be right there uh, in the midst of this river that we see in the paradise of God, and we will get to eat of the fruit of it. I love that. And then notice its leaves in verse uh, 2 there. He says, the leaves of the tree were from the healing of the nations. This is interesting because... If we're in our glorified state, our glorified body, we don't necessarily need water to live. It's for our enjoyment. Food as well. But it says here, but these leaves are to heal the nations. Why do we need healing if we're in our perfect glorified bodies? I looked up that phrase there, the healing. Healing in the Greek is therapia, which means life-giving. So it's not in the, the terms of healing of sickness, but more of promoting forever health, which is so interesting. I like what one Bible scholar said. He goes, the leaves are likened to supernatural vitamins. 
supernatural vitamins to promote health forever. So we have these beautiful things, river, fruit, leaves, this tree. Throughout scripture, these are symbols of uh, a variety of blessing, richness. As we see, it's going to promote health. Um, all these wonderful things that I just think that the world today so longs for, spends so much money on to live, uh, to gain wealth, uh, to live forever, forever to uh, keep our bodies healthy, strong, looking tight and fit and good. And this is everything that we get to have and experience in heaven. So friends, don't worry about, don't, don't put so much uh, or invest so much in your bodies because when you get to heaven, we're gonna have all of it. And this is something we should look forward to, that we should teach our kids and encourage our friends and, and share because as we see, and we see in scripture here that um, we wanna keep these words, we want to share these words, we wanna read these words, and we are gonna be blessed, John says in chapter one. Verse three, he also says there's no curse, there's no sorrow, there's no pain, there's no more Kleenex boxes, there's no more funerals to go to. No one's gonna die. There's no more pain, there's no more death. I love verse three, we're gonna serve him forever. If you're in, a, in employment right now and you hate your job, just know in heaven it's gonna be work that you're actually gonna enjoy. Just like that food, the fruit you're gonna eat, the water you're gonna drink from, it's gonna be for enjoyment. Our work and our tasks that we have, God's gonna have us on in heaven, it's gonna be for your enjoyment. I love that. It's going to be a variety of jobs. It's not going to be the same thing. Um, you can expect your home again to be forever of provision, peace, health, no pain, no sorrow, no death. For the unbeliever, I want to just mention for a moment. For the believer, our future is bright. It's forever. If you're an unbeliever here today, which I'm glad you're here if you are, Maybe you're seeking truth, what life's all about, trying to know what Jesus, who he is, trying to learn more scripture. Well, you need to know, scripture says, for the unbeliever, your future is very dark. Uh, scripture says it's a life of eternal torment. And you're gonna study that as you go through the book of Revelation. It's not bright, it's not pretty, but it's dark, it's painful, it's not going to be fun. You can read more about that in Revelation 20. I want you, though, to know, believer and unbeliever in this room, that God's heart, though, is that no man should perish. I want to read 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Peter says this, Do not forget this one thing. The Lord is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's heart for you, unbeliever, today. If you've not given your whole life, put your full trust in Jesus, but I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad you're listening to these words. God wants you here today. He brought you here today. If you're online, also listening, you need to know that God doesn't send anyone to hell. He made and created hell for Satan, his demons, he doesn't want any man to perish. That is his heart, and he is so long-suffering. Now, there will be a day and time where that time is done, and he will come back. But today is the day of salvation, and so if you've not committed your life to Jesus, the one who loved you, made you, and cares for you most of all, he says, you come. Come to me just as you are. Come to me in faith. Without faith, the Bible says, it's impossible to please God. But he who comes to God must believe that he is God. And he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He wants to reward you, he wants to bless you, he wants to change your life. Again, he's not, he didn't create hell for people to go to. Now it's our choice if we do, if we reject him. But again, his heart is that no man should 
perish. So be ready, he says, but the day of the Lord comes like a thief. Are you ready for the day for his return? Being ready is being forgiven, being reconciled back to God. You and I once were enemies, Scripture says, when we were walking in our flesh, not knowing God. But because of Jesus, what he did for us, we can now be reconciled back to God. Let him hear what the Spirit says. If the Spirit is speaking to you today, I, I really do pray you consider, you listen to his voice. He is inviting you to come to him. He says, whoever desires God, or whoever, it's in verse actually 17, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. So the invitation is for every person today. Now let's kind of now move on to verse 6, transitioning from knowing and kind of getting a taste of what our future home is. It's a bright one. It's a lovely one that we get to look forward to. Now, verse 6, the angel says these words, everything that I just said for the last 22 chapters, 21 chapters, he's saying it is absolutely true. It's not a fairy tale. It's not something that's false. It's not empty words. He says, it is true. In everything that I'm going to say, I believe this is twofold here. He says, then he said to me, John saying, this angel, these words are faithful and true. He's speaking about the past, the present, and the things to come. These words are not empty, they're not false, they're not a fairy tale, but they are faithful and true. He says, verse seven, behold, I am coming quickly. Do you all believe Jesus is coming? Yes. But do you believe that he's coming at any time? Yes. That quickly, the meaning is he's coming shortly, without delay. And he's coming when we don't expect him. Again, he comes as a thief. Not that Jesus is a thief, but like a thief, he comes when no one's expecting him to come. So Jesus here is saying, behold, church, I am coming quickly. It's going to come to pass. It's going to happen. Don't listen to all the naysayers. The one says, that's just a fairy tale. It's not going to happen. No, Jesus says, you can trust me. I am trustworthy. And I'm so glad, church, you and I have a God that is perfect and trustworthy. Do not put your trust in me or anybody else. What I have said many times, I'm trying to do better at it, but oftentimes what I have said, I don't follow through with. God, though, what he says, it comes to pass. I love what my dad taught me at an early age in life. He says, Jess, do not put your hope, trust on people because they're going to disappoint you. And that is true. Now, I know... We try our best, we try to come through, we try to make our yeses yeses and our noes be noes, but we do have our faults. But God, on the other hand, is perfect. And what he says is so true and it's gonna come to pass. So friends, put your trust in him. He is trustworthy. I love what Isaiah 46, verse 9, 11, he says, for I am God, there is no one like me. My purpose will be established. I'll accomplish all my good pleasure Truly, I will bring it to pass. I have planned it, he says. That's Isaiah prophesying. And God will surely do it. Meaning, if I confess my sins to God, as 1 John chapter 1 says, God says, well, I'm faithful to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of all of your unrighteousness. I was looking when John was mentioning that or showing that picture of all those folks in Ireland. I, I know many of them and they're dear friends, faithful. Keep them in your prayers. But just being in Ireland for uh, those few years, the Irish being rooted in Roman Catholicism, um, they, of course, believe or they, in their mind, God is far. He's angry at me. How could he love me? How could he even forgive me of all my deeds I've done? And so they just naturally just kind of walk away like there's really no hope. They come to the end of their life saying, well, I hope. 
I hope, but there's no assurance with many of the people in Ireland. But I want us to know, I want them to know, and we were trying to in those three years we were there saying there is great assurance and when you do come to Christ, when you do confess your sin with a genuine heart, when you do mourn after your sin, like the Bible says, I am faithful to forgive you of all your sin and cleanse you from all of your unrighteousness. You're forgiven. I don't even think of it. It's forgotten as far as the east is to the west. What a great truth that is. And again, it is trustworthy. When the devil tells you different, say that's not true. Jesus is trustworthy. You can count on him. What he says, it is going to happen. What a wonderful, wonderful truth. So I've stepped into verse 7 here. It is a wonderful promise. Jesus says, blessed, if you want to be a happy youth, child, man, woman, individual. He says, blessed, happy is he, she, who, whoever it might be, if you keep my words, if you keep my words of the prophecy of this book. I want to talk about that. What's it look like to keep the words of this prophecy? And then just kind of, I'm going to extend that to the whole word of God. Well, the, the, the word keep there is twofold. It means to guard or defend, and it also means to obey. And that's in, in Scripture. Let's, let's just kind of take the first one, to guard and defend. Paul says to young Timothy, he says, Oh, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, meaning guard the word of God, what's been given, that treasure, and guard also your faith. They kind of go hand in hand. So, for example, if someone comes or you face someone that is denying its relevancy, defend it. If you come against someone or a critic who denies its veracity and authority, guard it, defend it. That's your call as a believer. Again, happy you will be if you do so. I love this truth. If you face a confused interpreter of the Bible, I'll say, defend it. Guard it. Speak about it. Speak what is true. If he's obscuring its meaning and is not saying what is true. And then the, Jesus says, obey it as well. So to guard it, but to obey it, and you'll be a happy soul. Jesus says in the Gospels, if you love me, you will, here it is, keep. That's that word, same word. Keep my commands, obey my commands. First John chapter 2 says, By this we know that we have come to know him. So if you're questioning, do I know God? Well, here's how you know if you keep his commands. There's a lot of professing Christians, but in the same hand, they're not obeying Christians. Obedient Christians. There's a big difference there. If you're a genuine believer, naturally you begin to obey the Lord. Not saying perfectly. I just messed up yesterday. I just repented. Lord, I am so sorry. But naturally, willingly, I want to, to obey him with God's help and by his spirit. He says, you'll know him if you keep his commands. If you do not keep his commandments or obey John says, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. He says, those who keep the words of the prophecy of this book, what does it mean specifically to guard and to obey this book, Revelation, you're going to be going through in the fall? Specifically, here's, some, um, here's kind of a starter for uh, keeping the words of this book. Uh, Jesus, which you guys have already gone through, the seven churches, here's some of the commands he's given to you and I as believers. He says, don't leave your first love. God's saying, keep that. Don't put job, even family, other things, sports. Put me first. I am to be number one, supreme, the preeminent one of your life. Don't ever Lose me as your first love. That's one of them. He also says, be faithful until death. That's one of the commands to one of the churches in the seven churches. Another one is hold fast to my name and doctrine. 
There's a lot of different teachings in, out there in the evangelical world, in the church. He says, keep what is true. Hold tight to it. Another one, don't live like a lukewarm Christian. That was to the lukewarm church. You guys went through that this last spring, I believe. Be watchful. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. I love the church in Philadelphia, the faithful church. Small, not many resources, but they took the open door God gave them. I love that. And they are faithful to it. Also, he says, if you hear my voice, open the door of your heart. He's speaking to the church there in chapter 3. He also calls believers to desire heaven, desire holiness, desire for evil to end, which we see all through Revelation. He is going to bring judgment, and he's going to get rid of evil. Praise the Lord. He's going to put Satan in the lake of fire, the false prophet, the Antichrist. All of it's going to be done away with. We should be praising God. A lot of the martyrs you'll see, those who died in the tribulation, they're praising God. Lord, have your vengeance. We should be praising God for these things. He desires us to disconnect ourselves to the evil systems. You're going to see that in Revelation 17 and 18, talking about the great harlot, the Babylon the great, the evil systems of the world. We are to uh, disconnect from them, not pursue them or be passionate about them. And then he says, pursue heavenly realities, long for your resurrected body, anticipate eternal rewards. Those are all things that uh, we can begin to keep, to obey and to guard as he says there, blessed is he who keeps. Let's keep moving forward in our second response for the believer in light of Jesus' return. He goes, I'm going to go down now to verse 9. He says, worship God. So we're to guard, defend the word of God as a believer. Number two, or and obey it. Number two, we're supposed to worship God as a believer. You're going, well, Jess, I know that. I've been told that all my life in the church. Well, could you tell me, though, what that exactly means? When you talk about worship, it's an in-depth study. I'm just going to kind of give you a little framework from Psalm 95, one of the many psalms that give great detailed descriptions of what and how the believer should worship. Number one, our worship should involve using our lips and voices. You know this. You just did it before I came up. Praising God. The psalmist says there in verse 1, we should sing, we should shout joyfully, and in our praise, we should be thankful. Be thankful of what? The psalmist says, be thankful for who he is. When you're praising, Lord, I'm thankful for who you are. He's great, the psalmist says. He's eternal. He goes on to say, because he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, he's everywhere. He says also, well, it continues on, but let's, let's keep moving on. Uh, part of our worship should be bowing down to him, so we should praise him in thanksgiving. We should bow down to him using our knees. It's a bit of beautiful picture of our souls deeply respecting God, adoring God, blessing his name, because there's always a because in this beautiful psalm, because he's our maker, because he's purchased us by his blood, because he's our shepherd who gives us, of course, rest. He restores our souls, leads us, comforts us. Our worship should involve listening. This is one growing up, being in the church, I never really, really kind of put the two together. I knew, okay, I'm supposed to sing. That's worship. I didn't necessarily know at an early age to, I need to bow down, surrender, adore, and respect him deeply, bless his name. But now as I'm getting older, this one I'm really getting to understand more. Worship is listening. Listening to God's voice. Psalm 95, 8, the psalmist says, Today hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as those who don't know God. Open your heart, open your ears. God is saying, listen to me. Listen to my voice this morning. Be people that say what I ask them to say. Be people that do what I ask them to do. 
And he wants us to be people to go where he calls us to go. That's a little description of what it looks like to be a true worshiper of God, to be using our lips as praise, using our knees to bow, surrender, and adore, and bless, and then also using our ears to listen to him. What a beautiful picture. As, um, Ecclesi- Ecclesiastes chapter 5 says, Guard your steps as you go to the house of God. And here it is, draw near to listen. That's our jobs here this morning. And God will change you and make you more into his image when you do that very thing. And I've been learning that little by little in my life. The third response, if you're taking notes today, I know I'm going through this pretty quick, but I did want to share all this to you this morning. The third response for the believer, in light of Jesus' return, you can say, because Jesus is returning. I love this. He says in verse 10, do not seal the words of this book. What does that mean, Jess? Well, in other words, it means we need to proclaim. So not to seal it, but to proclaim it. This is our job. John was commanded in chapter 1, if you remember back that far, Jesus says, write the things that are in the past, the present, and what is to come. He wrote that for you and I to then proclaim, to share, to hear, to know. I was just with a group of about probably 20 pastors about a month and a half ago from all different denominations. We had a lovely time of fellowship in Eaton. And I I got together with this one. He's not part of Calvary Chapel. He is a church just kind of north in Tennessee. And we had a great time just kind of sharing what's on our hearts. He asked me, hey, what's God have you, what's he having you focus on and doing? What are you excited for? All these kind of different questions. And one of the things I mentioned to him is saying, we've been studying uh, Revelation. It's been such a wonderful book, a challenging book. It's been... um, just been such an encouragement, and he looked at me, and it was just quiet. And I I remember that very moment, he says, Jess, in my 35 years of preaching, he goes, I've never taught through the book of Revelation. 35 years. And unfortunately, as I'm learning more and more, that is quite often in the evangelical church that many are robbing believers of these amazing truths that we are not to seal up, but instead to proclaim. That's why I do love Calvary Chapel being part of the family because we do make, you know, do our best to get through all of the Bible and through every verse as much as we can. The good, or I'm sorry, it's not, they're all good, but the hard and even the easy ones to listen to. And I'm going to touch on that as well. But friends, we are to be people that read, that hear, obey these words, but to also proclaim. If we do not, as a preacher, I fail to carry out God's command. And then again, I rob you or other people that are my listeners of these very truths of God's plan for our future. And so may we be people that continue to proclaim and not seal up this book. I want to go into verse, it's kind of out of order of my points, but if they're even up there, verse 18 and 19, go with me there real quick. What time am I at here? Okay, so um, he says this, for I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds, To these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of this book, of the prophecy, God should take away his part of the book of life. So this is the warning. He's given us a promise. Blessed is he who guards and defends, obeys, and then he gives a warning at the end. The very last words of the whole Bible. He's saying, do not be a legalist which, in other words, is that adding. We're not to add to God's word, like the Pharisees did, if you remember, in all the Gospels. 
adding man-made traditions and rules and all these things that burden the people. God never intended for them. He says, do not be a legalist. He says, if you do, you're inviting my judgment upon you. And then on the other hand, he says, don't take away from my word. That's called uh, liberalism. So you have legalists and being a liberal, I'll say. Liberalism, which it's kind of looking at God's word and deciding on your own to say, well, I'll believe that, but I won't believe that. I'll teach this, but I won't teach that. That actually applies today, and this doesn't apply today. God says, do not do that. He says, or you're inviting judgment upon yourself. So again, it's not up to us. We just need to be faithful communicators. That's our job as believers, to faithfully communicate God's word, not to make it or change it the way we think it should be. And these were really heavy words for me as a preacher, but I think it applies to us as uh, Christians as well, that we need to take God's word seriously. Never to tamper with it. The fifth response for the believer, I'm going to keep moving. In light of Jesus' coming, he, uh, he says to serve. Now go back with me to 12, and I got the... The term served by 12, it says, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Are you serving the Lord today? That's one of God's commands for each Christian. He doesn't want us to be a lazy servant or a lazy Christian, a, one that's just kind of being idle and just waiting around for him. He wants us to be busy about his work. What's it look like to serve God in this church. Romans 12, verse 6, well, he says, Paul says, to use your gifts. God has given you a gift, each one of you, perhaps quite a few gifts. And I believe uh, you may have gifts now and maybe tomorrow or months to come when God calls you to do something else and you actually step out in obedience, he then will give you a gift and all that you need for that. So don't be... The Christian that says, well, that's not my gift, so I'm just going to stay put. If God is calling you and you're hearing his voice, he's first like Moses, he had to step out in faith, and then God gave him everything that he needed to accomplish that. So remember that. But again, the Lord has given you a a gifts according to the grace. He says, let us use them. If it's prophecy, prophesy. If it's ministry, minister. If he who teaches, teach. If you are one that exhorts, do it in exhortation. He who gives, give generously. He who has the gift of leading, do it with all diligence. He who shows mercy, do it with cheerfulness. If you have a gift of healing, lay hands on people and heal in faith. If you have the gifts of help, help people, administrations, and so on. So that's one way that we are to serve God in the church. And then also, in Colossians chapter 3, 23, he says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. How do we serve God in the church? Work and do it with all your heart, with everything that you have, as working for the Lord, Paul says, not for human Masters, Don't do it because people are looking at you. Do it because God sees it. And he's so pleased when we do. He goes on to say, since you know that you will receive an inheritance. That's the, the part. Verse 12. Serve the Lord because he's coming back to give everyone according to his, re, uh, his work a reward. I love that. And remember also that your works, your deeds will be tested on judgment day as a believer. We're going to be going through the good judgment, not the great white throne judgment, but the Bema seat judgment. But in that time, at some point, Scripture says, Paul says that our deeds will be tested by fire. And the deeds and the works and the service that we and you and I did for the Lord will endure the test. They will actually get to go right through the fire 
but the ones that Jess McKernan did in his flesh, or maybe because I wanted people to see, they're not going to last. They're not going to endure the test. Paul says this, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone work endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone work is burned, he will suffer a loss. He himself will be saved. So he's saying, Christian, if you did something in the flesh or because you wanted to do it, it will be burned, but you still will be saved. So that's, again, you're not going to be cast into the fiery furnace or the lake of fire, but you will be saved, but a reward will be burned. And so in heaven, you will receive rewards, but some of the things I've done will be lost in the fire. But again, the point is, may we be people, because Jesus is coming back, to be faithful, diligent, obedient servants to the Lord. And lastly, our sixth response. In verse 17, I want to look at this. Every believer should long for, I think I put up there, um, that we should, um, every believer should desire for the, the Lord's return, to have him come back. I want to read verse 17. In the spirit and the bride, that's you and I, the church, say, Come. It's this picture of us longing for Christ to return. And let him who hears say come. And let him who thirsts come. So it's this beautiful picture of the Christian soul longing for Jesus' return. The psalmist in 42, he says, does your soul thirst like the deer who pants for desires the water? Do we long for uh, God to come back, Jesus to come back from heaven with that shout, with the voice, the trumpet of God, which Paul talks about, where the church is being caught up in the air together, where we'll be with him forever? Are we longing for the day when we'll actually be in heaven during Jesus' second coming after the tribulation, where all of heaven will come down with him and you and I will conquer and will reign with a rod, Scripture says, for a thousand years with Christ. These are some of the things that Scripture says that we ought to be longing for. Now, I want to end, though, with this point, going back to the unbeliever. If you are here today and you are not longing, you're actually afraid. I've come across many people that don't want to talk about it, just want to dismiss it, ignore it, because they're not ready for Jesus to return. They may have heard about it, talked about it, but in their hearts, they give you a look saying, I am not ready for Jesus to come back. Why is that? Well, it could be because they're not born again. It could be they're walking dead in their sin. It could be because, as Ephesians says, they're walking according to this world and not being led by the Spirit, which Paul says in Romans, conducting yourself in the lust of your flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and not of the Spirit. Those are big reasons why a lot of people aren't wanting Jesus to come back and not longing for him to come back. Are you ready to face Christ today? Jesus says, to be ready, I come like a thief. I'm going to come quickly and unexpected. So be ready. Paul says in Thessalonians, you and I, true believers, should be ready. We're sons of day, not of night. We're clothed with his righteous garments. We're ready. But there are some people that are of the night, that when he comes like a thief, they're going to be not ready. And I believe that's where scripture says they will miss the opportunity of the rapture of the church and they will be left behind in the great day of the Lord, the tribulation period, which is absolutely terrible. And so be ready. Jesus is saying to you and I today, wherever you may be, you don't have to be dead in your sins. Paul says as a Christian, we are not dead in our sins, but we're dead to sins. By the Spirit, you and I we have the power to say no to sin now. We don't have to walk in sin like we used to. We don't have to be a slave to sin as we used to. But now we're dead to sin. And now our bodies are governed and to be led by the Holy Spirit. 
you can be forgiven and cleansed today. You can be free of sin. You can be walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I love this invitation where he, he ends in verse 17. Whoever desires, that's whoever, whoever so desires, let him take the water of life freely. That's an invitation for everyone today. If your desires for truth, he says, you come. If your desires to be forgiven of sin, to not walk in guilt and shame more, he says, you come and I will save you and free you and cleanse you of all of your sin. Whoever desires, let him take the waters of life freely. But look at and notice 11. He says, but those who are unjust, let them be unjust. It's almost like the angel saying, I have talked about, I have shown the world everything what's going to happen. If they don't believe up to this point, I don't know what else to say. And you're going to get to that as you study Revelation. Throughout the tribulation period, God is so merciful. I was telling Neil this the other day, kind of a theme through chapter 6 all the way to chapter, you could say, 20, which is the great tribulation period, the seven years upon this earth. There are so many wonderful acts of God's mercy coming to earth, giving people a chance to return to him. But you're going to notice that people love their sin and they don't want to turn to Christ. God shows himself, angels are flying, he sends two witnesses, he's doing so much for these people, but they will turn from him. And this is this wonderful, well, this sad verse, really, 11. Those who are unjust, let them be unjust still. He who is filthy, let them be filthy still. God is so merciful. Today he's given you a chance to, if again you're not a believer, you come to him, consider him today. Believers, again, your future is bright. If you're those struggling in sin today, come forward and receive prayer. Be set free of that. If you're an unbeliever, come forward. We'd love to pray with you. If you really are seeking and wanting to put your full faith and trust in Christ, I'll end with this verse in Revelation. He goes, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear.